Um, everybody, as you're coming in, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us for tonight's presentation, Why Black Lives Matter. My name is Katie Hopkins. I am the Adult Programming Coordinator for the Springfield Green County Library District. I am serving somewhat as your host this evening in the background. I'm monitoring the chat and any technical issues or other concerns as they might come up. Uh, this evening's presentation features a panel of artists, educators, and historians who will discuss the unique aesthetics of Blackness in regards to arts and culture with the goal of creating a greater understanding and appreciation of the cultural contributions of Black lives. A recorded version of this webinar will be posted to the library's YouTube channel in the coming weeks. Tonight's discussion is facilitated by Jonathan Herbert, theater program head at Ozarks Technical Community College. And we're joined by our panelists, Dr. David Duncor, professor of African-American studies, performance studies and theater at Texas A&M. Dr. Marlon Barber, professor of African-American history at Missouri State University. And Jin J. X, singer songwriter and CEO of the Jin J. X Music Group. Gentlemen, thank you all so much for being with us tonight. We really appreciate your time. After tonight's discussion, our panelists will take questions from the audience. You can ask your questions at any point during the presentation. There's a Q&A link at the bottom of your screen, right in the middle, and you can click that and put your questions in at any time. They may take those questions during the presentation or they may save them for the end. This is be organic. We'll just see how it goes. There's also a chat feature you can use during the presentation if you have technical questions for me, or if you wish to make a comment during the presentation, I will be monitoring that. So um, to hear about upcoming library programs like this and others, be sure to visit thelibrary.org slash programs or pick up a copy of bookends at your favorite branch. You can also visit thelibrary.org slash newsletter to sign up to receive emails to notify you about upcoming programs that are tailored to your interests. So again, thank you all for being here. And Jonathan, I'm going to hand things over to you now. Great, thank you so much, Katie. Mm -hmm. It's really, really wonderful to be here. Thank you all for being part of this. And uh, thank you to the panelists, uh, Dr. David Doncor, Dr. Marlon Barber, and Jin J. X. Um, three gentlemen who I am um, super inspired by in so many ways and in different ways. Um, uh, I, I, um, I want to just kind of start by also saying thank you to the Springfield Green County Library District for um, stepping up in this time when, um, when racial injustice is in our faces again and, uh, and, and doing what you can to bring people together in conversation uh, that will hopefully be progressive and, um, and, and, and hopefully uh, uh, be hold, hold those who need to be accountable, accountable and, and so forth. But this program tonight is, uh, is called Why, Why Black Lives Matter. We say Black Lives Matter because, um, you know, it seems like on a daily basis, uh, it is, I think, on a daily basis that black men are un black men and women are unjustly killed uh, in violence. And we want to assert, as people did in the 60s with their I am a man uh, posters, that black lives matter. That is important. <clears throat> but uh, when, uh, when Jesse East, the branch manager of the Library Center, asked me what I wanted to, uh, to do to facilitate a panel on, I was in the process of thinking about Black aesthetics and like what makes Black art Black? What makes Blackness Black? <clears throat> um, out, uh, of course, Black people love Blackness and Black art, but many, many people who are not Black do as well and, 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 and don't necessarily know why. And so I've called together uh, Dr. David Doncor, uh, who has a, a, a vast experience in performing arts, theater, African studies, 
Um, he, he grew up in Ghana, but he's lived in the United States for since 1994. I've called Marlon, Dr. Marlon Barber, uh, who is a history professor um, and, and, and uh, specializes in African American history. And I've called Dr. Uh, Dr. Emeritus, uh, not Emeritus, but uh, 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 honorary Dr. Jen JX, um, who is uh, um, one of the smartest people I know about music. Um, together to talk about what is what does blackness really mean um, in terms of the way we typically access it, which is through the humanities, through art and culture. And so, um, so I want to just kind of start by inviting Dr. Dancor, Dr. Barber, and Jen to uh, uh, to speak to us and just kind of introduce yourself briefly. And, and tell us basically why, when I asked you if you would be a panelist for this particular discussion, why you said yes. Uh, we'll start with Dr. Dancor. Yes, uh, I realize I had my mic off. Okay, I'm back on. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, um, I'm, I'm David Dancor. I, I, I teach at Texas A&M and um, the introductions were on point. So. I will, I will not uh, add to that. Um, but um, I, the, the, the question of blackness comes up uh, um, a lot in what I do. Um, if um, as a person in, in, in the theater, um, I tend to have to make choices about body decisions, about bodies, decisions about representation uh, um, all the time. And so, um, and and as a person of, of color who is often called upon to um, 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 represent blackness on stage and in and in 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 my research, the question of what is black, right, um, comes up quite often. And so, um, as an artist, I I, I ask that uh, I I I know what black is. I live blackness. But I am compelled now and then to also ask that question. I, I as a researcher, uh, it's the same thing for me. And so it is this constant query about the boundaries of blackness, if there are any, um, um, is is one of the things that attracts me to this conversation and why I said yes. That's how I'll start. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Dancor. And uh, Dr. Barber? Uh, yes, uh, Marlon Barber here. And uh, again, just kind of echoing my, my colleague, David. Uh, the, you know, this, uh, you know, really was an opportunity, I, I think, to kind of speak to a lot of things uh, for me personally, uh, just from a, from a historical standpoint, since that is my specialty. Uh, I really specialize in early American history in the 19th century, which encompasses um, a large part enslavement. <clears throat> and so I really, and when John talked about the black aesthetic, um, I, I get to see that a lot in my own personal research, uh, as well as in my teaching. I, I get a chance to examine uh, how and why and in what context people of the diaspora uh, the African diaspora were able to bring culture with them and infuse it into arguably the, the, the Atlantic world narrative, um, and in particular, the American uh, narrative. Uh, you know, many times, you know, we hear about the, an American story, an American culture, which is kind of an amalgamation of a whole lot of cultures, but many times the black aspect of that culture kind of gets downplayed. And, um, you know, in my teachings and in my readings, I, I really get a chance to show that and to demonstrate that and to give evidence where you can see that. It's not a matter of me expressing an opinion. It's a matter of, hey, here's, you know, here's where I'm getting this information. And I get a chance to show that and to, to, to help people um, kind of see that. And so, um, I'm, I'm really hoping to kind of get a chance to, to do that again with, um, with this conversation tonight. So but thank you for having me. And thank you for being here. <clears throat> and uh, Dr. Jen, Brother Jen, 
tell us uh, tell us about yourself and why you're here. Absolutely, it's an honor to be here, and I I thank you for having me. Um, I know getting the invite was a was an honor because I know um, with so much that has been going on, especially in the last roughly six months, there's been um, there's been a lot that I've wanted to say, but sometimes I felt that, um, ironically, as a black person, that you know my voice would not be heard in certain spaces, and so uh, to get the opportunity to kind of speak about my own um, experience in blackness as a person that like, and you and I have talked about this, grown up in mainly white spaces, sometimes. Um, getting comfortable with the idea of blackness, sometimes that's a big first step for a lot of us. So uh, I'm really honored to be here and I'm, I'm excited for us to kind of dig into this. Thank you, Jim. So um, what, uh, just to kind of let, let you all know um, who are here, you know, kind of observing, you know, from outside, where this kind of started with me and where I want to start the conversation is um, <clears throat> I was asked <clears throat> something to the effect of, if you could, uh, you know, facilitate a panel on any topic, what would it be? And I was in the process of uh, developing a black theater course, <clears throat> and um, I was thinking a lot about black aesthetics. And there is a lecture by um, there's a lecture that I that I that I turn to on the internet that I will um, I'll put the link in the chat before we finish here, if anybody wants to look at it. But um, in the lecture, uh, uh, Sister Luna uh, speaks um, about defining blackness and she quotes uh, Dr. Yaba Blay, who is a scholar and an activist who says, I think blackness is beautifully complicated. I think it is color. I think it is culture. I think it is a consciousness. I think it is a history. It's a legacy. It's an inheritance. It's a political identity. It's a social identity. It's so many things, but each one of us enters the conversation with a different framework. Identifying with whatever one of those parts of blackness is the most important to us. We speak through our blackness in those ways. And I wanna just kind of like you start with that quote a little bit because of the conversation uh, gentlemen that you and I had the other night really kind of spoke to this. We all are sort of coming to this from three from four very, very different perspectives, um, different experiences of blackness. Um, and we talked a lot about essentialist uh, views of blackness versus kind of a, um, a, a post-black, post-modern sort of post-black view and things like that. So I wanna just kind of ask you all to respond to that quote a little bit, this idea that blackness is beautifully complicated. I wanna kind of start there because I think we've all sort of grown up with people and 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 with media and with culture, American culture, trying to kind of put blackness in a box. Everybody wants to put it in a box. So I want to just ask you all to just talk a little bit about, from your perspective, what is blackness? Uh, uh, what is your that lens through which you look, or that framework framework through which you look? You know that that defines blackness for you. <clears throat> well, me, uh, may I start? Yes, please. It, for me, there's, I mean, there's something biographical that, that, that has shaped my thought or at least prompted my thinking about it. And, um, you know, I, I spent the, the early years of my life in Ghana where I was aware I was black, but I never really interrogated it because almost everyone was most of the time, not all of the time, but most of the time. And so the issue of it and, and what it means and its significance uh, was not at the forefront of our thoughts, right? You imagined people's experiences of it, but it, it was not. So I tend to say that I started, uh, <laughs> I started thinking about my blackness more at the forefront of my uh, uh, consciousness uh, when I came to the United States, right? And so, um, Living in the United States made me, um, you know, my United States marked my difference in ways that I uh, 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 did not experience in Ghana. Um, and so there was a way in which I immediately realized my ties and my affinities with people of African descent in the United States, but my difference with them as well were 
immediately obvious. And so I basically found myself living Marlon, Marlon, is Marlon Riggs uh, film, documentary film, Black is Black Ain't, right? Um, where, where, where I was, the, the isness for me was reminding me of all the connections that I had with people when I worked at a, 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 a theater company and looking at, at just people's movements and gestures and cadences of language and feeling a connection with them or how they reacted in laughter to a joke. But at the same time, um, having those moments where um, people will signify in a particular way that is very, very in group that I would immediately be outside of. And so all of those things uh, made me uh, uh, um, um, live this. But I, I'll also say um, that in addition to thinking about blackness as black is, black ain't, it also, my experiences living across the Atlantic um, made me imagine blackness as something that is here and that is there, but that is everywhere, <laughs> right? So here means that, I mean, there is, there is a, a localized blackness that we understand that we live all the time and that we can assume is what defines it. But it's, it's often important for us to be, remind, rem, be reminded also that there's a blackness that is there. And so what we experience as blackness um, uh, is a shade of the multiplicities of blackness that we, we, we can live. But then also blackness is everywhere. And as I teach a class popular music in the African diaspora and my students are, and I'm always continually amazed about how widely dispersed people of African descent are, you know, and, and we are learning about people of African descent even in Sri Lanka. And so that, that, that highlights uh, uh, this idea of Black being here, being there, being everywhere, uh, uh, to me, uh, uh, quite, quite, uh, quite intensely. Well, and it's, it's really, that can be really problematic. You know, uh, as I develop the class that I was talking about teaching, I've mentioned to my wife that I'm going to be teaching a, uh, an African-American th theater class. And she's like, is it an African American theater class or is it a black theater class? You know, because, you know, I mean, are you just talking about Americans who descend from Africa or are you excluding anybody in South America when you say this? And so the problem, you know, I mean, the, the issue, it's not a problem, but the issue becomes a bit more complicated just in terms of the language that we use. It just kind of happened to think about that when you mentioned your last comment. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, David. Uh, Marlon. Um, uh, uh, go ahead and, and uh, uh, please respond to the uh, the quote. I probably ought to share that quote on the screen. I think I can share my screen, so um, maybe I'll, um, I'll pull that up. But go ahead and, yeah, and get. Yeah, no, uh, I, I think uh, just kind of realizing uh, that, and, and I and this kind of comes through in, in in my teachings as well. You know, I try to convey and in conversations to people that. It, there's not just one defining aspect or even two defining aspects of what black is or, um, you know, if we're talking about an aesthetic or, or even, you know, cultural concepts. Um, you know, in other words, black people nor are any group monolithic. Black people will come from things or look at things from as many different perspectives as there are human beings. Uh, and so to assume that, well, just because there's this shared trait that individuals will kind of see things through the same lens or, or you know, that, that's, it's not always that way, um, which in my opinion, that, that adds to the beauty of things because you, you do get a chance to see, well, you know, just because you have um, you know, a, a black person that black person might be from uh, from a from a city, and they're going to see things differently. I personally grew up in a small town and in, in a rural area, um, but you know, I had I had a lot of family that was also from the rural area. So I'm I'm actually you know I, I you know the the knowing and being aware of my blackness uh, came at a very young age. I attended a school where at one point in time I was the only black child there from. You know, 
you know, uh, at a school that was kindergarten through eighth grade. Uh, you know, and so at a very young age, I was aware of that. Uh, however, I was also, you know, in an environment where I had a lot of family. And so I did experience, um, you know, black music, um, black dance, black vernacular, um, you know, but, you know, that, that, you know, it, it, it allowed me growing up to, to be able to move between worlds, um, if you will. Um, and so it, it probably wasn't as big of a shock as, as David's was coming from, from, you know, Africa to the United States, but at a, but, you know, kind of growing up in that, I was able to, to, to move between worlds and to see that. Um, uh, so, I mean, that's, the, you know, kind of what I, what I think about. Uh, whenever you know, eat with, with that particular quote, you know, because it is complicated. It's not just one thing. Um, and people adapt and adjust to it differently based on who they are, who their family is, kind of their, their, you know, their experiences. Thank you, Marlon. Um, Brother Jim. Yes, sir. Um, I, I actually, and I'm appreciating what I'm hearing so much. I, I actually kind of want to uh, piggyback on what uh, Dr. Marvin was saying in terms of um, sometimes I think the tendency is for Blackness to be put in a monolithic group. And uh, for someone like myself that grew up um, really in space that was mostly white people and, and often being the only Black person, I think most children are essentially raceless until at least for me until like the idea of a certain concept of blackness being projected um that was you know that was something that at times was very frustrating because you feel like someone's trying to um project onto you something that's not you you know and so for me uh the idea of blackness is something that i think every individual does have to construct for themselves every single black person has to basically say you know in this society, I'm going to be considered black no matter, you know, what I think about myself. That's something that I need to address deep within myself. I need to accept and I need to basically uh, construct my righteous black self. I, I can't let someone define for me what blackness is when they're not black, when they're not going to have to walk through this space as a black person. So for me, that was a very important step. And um studying history of our people, studying, reading Dr. Martin Luther King, reading Malcolm X, reading some of these uh, men and women that were, for me personally, as a person that again, grew up kind of without much uh, to look up to in that regard, being able to uh, see these powerful voices of blackness and kind of see myself in that. And so I think that that's important. I think that every person has to go through that. But you know, it, it's interesting, you know, that you say that because uh, you, you grew up similar to the way that I grew up and similar to the way that uh, Dr. Barber just said that he grew up um, in that you, we sort of grew up predominantly around white people. Um, so your first notion of yourself as a black person, uh, your first notions, at least some of your first notions, some of the, some really influential ones came from people who were not black, right? And, and, you know, I, I learned about my blackness from white kids, you know, on the playground who made sport of me, for instance, you know, and, and, um, and so uh, it's, it's, you know, you said that we, we have to kind of, you know, kind of come to our own understanding of that, but we kind of didn't start that way, you know, and, um, and, and even in a, in a, you know, I sort of zoom out from that experience, even if you talk about people who sort of grow up in, um, in predominantly black settings, the art historically is often sort of, um, you know, promoted and promulgated by, you know, white producers uh, who perpetuate a certain image, like the hip hop culture just happened to produce gangster rap at the same time that Ronald Reagan, you know, waged a war on drugs, you know, which was really a war on black people, black poor people. And so um, it's interesting to kind of, you know, to kind of figure like where, where did these ideas come from and how do we find our own ideas? 
Mm -hmm. Well, it, it, it's funny you mentioned that because um, there was a, and I've known a lot of the history about this for a while, but there was actually a, um, I think it was a New York Times article that talked about, it was something to the effect of uh, what's up with everyone stealing black music or something like that. And it talked about um, a particular, there were a lot of like minstrel shows that existed and kind of troops but it talked about a gentleman, I think it was Thomas Dartmouth Rice that was one of the early minstrels. And they talked about how, I mean, there's so much there, I'll try to like, you know, make it something that, that we can talk about quickly, but uh, many of the instruments like the banjo, the banjar came directly from Africa. Mm -hmm. And I think that people don't realize that for roughly 200 years, the banjo was a plantation instrument. It was not touched by white people. It was kind of considered something that black people did on farms and, and that was that. And it took um, this guy um, basically seeing someone playing a banjo, a black person playing a banjo and going, hmm, I can do something with this. And so he painted his face black and he basically learned the rudiments of this, this instrument. And then it went from a plantation instrument to all of a sudden you couldn't make enough of them in the United States. And so to me, I guess, piggybacking off your point, I'm mindful of that. A lot of times it goes back to a projection of blackness. Sometimes I have to ask, you know, there might be black people doing something, but is this the heart, mind and true voice of black people when I'm seeing it? Are there um, people that are benefiting from a certain image of blackness that does not necessarily benefit black people? Sometimes I think looking deeper, that's a big step because a lot of times it's easy for us to just assume, well, if black people are doing it, it must be black, right? And I, I don't think that's necessarily the case all the time. Um, if, I, if I could even just kind of add to that too, uh, and then just coming from a, from a historian, putting on my historian's hat, um, there, there's, there's actually a lot of, of, of scholarly literature on things like this. Um, and in particular, I'm actually just looking at a book. I'll just pop it up on here. It's um, a historian. She's at SLU, uh, Katrina Thompson at St. Louis University. And she has this book called Ring Shout and Rule About It. And it is actually about um, what she calls the racial politics of music and dance in North American enslavement or North American slavery. And in other words, kind of what she is getting at is that there is this duality that existed um, historically uh, within the confines of enslavement, and that for many Black people, because they had no option because of being enslaved, they had no option that for a lot of the dancing and the singing, they did it for entertainment purposes, and they knew this. They absolutely knew this. However, whenever they were within their own worlds, so they were basically in a, in, a, in a black world, in a black environment amongst themselves, they did things very differently. It was not the same. They knew and they understood that, um, that for white people um, and people that were enslaving them, that it was a mode of entertainment, um, kind of what they were doing. And they understood that and they knew that. However, when they were amongst themselves, it was very different. There was a, 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 a there was there were there were deeper cultural roots that were attached to that um, uh, communal roots, com roots to the community and in that community. And the same would be true of any literature, any songs, any spirituals. Um, you know that, that was that was all a part of what they were creating. Um, you know, and, and and again, just kind of looking at it from you know centuries ago. Um, you know, that was that was very much a part of their worlds and what they were creating. And I think that you can see a lot of that carrying forward. Um, however, what ends up when did, what ended up happening is that people were trying to figure out, as, Jim, as you were saying, hey, how can we capitalize on this? Meaning, you know, how can we profit from this? Uh, and and I think that that has played a large role in well, we we, we know that this is something that can be marketable. Uh, and how can we market it to a wider uh, audience and of course profit from it? And then, then you have music, then you have clothing, then you have 
you know, whether it's jazz or hip hop, uh, rock and roll. Um, I mean, all of that becomes a marketing uh, instrument um, or opportunity. This 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 topic could could be an entire uh, <laughs> an entire episode. The topic of sort of the history of the appropriation and the co-opting of um, and the expropriation, the, the the theft really of of a cultural voice. Um, I want to uh, uh, just kind of use that idea um, of, of expropriation to kind of shift into another line of com uh, communication, conversation. Um, there's a, uh, a Rebecca Walker, the, 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 um, the daughter of Alice Walker said at one point when talking about black, uh, black culture, she said, we don't separate yoga from India or Hinduism. Uh, we don't separate French cooking from the French. And so the result of that is that all of these cultures have a kind of social currency on the global stage. But if blackness is separated from culture and origin, and, and um, uh, Sister Luina, who, who, who I, I borrowed this, this from her lecture, says, finish that sentence. If, if, if she says, but if blackness is separated from the culture of origin, dot, 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 right? Like, what, what does that mean? You know, and so I, I'm, I'm interested in this idea of cultural currency and the importance of specifying what makes Blackness Black, what makes Black art Black, what makes Black culture Black, what makes Black church Black, what makes, what is, why is it important? Um, why, again, according to the title of this conversation, why does Black life matter? Um, I'm, I'm not questioning that it does, but just like, what is it? You, it's so many people who are not black love blackness. What is that about? So, what is the what is this idea of culture of social currency? And uh, I just want to kind of throw that out there as food for thought, and just invite anybody who wants to kind of speak on that. I uh, uh, recently I have been thinking about the uh, trying to think a little bit more complexly about the idea of code switching, right? And uh, we tend to think about code switching in, in sort of a, in, in linguistic terms, right? Um, and I've been thinking about how much uh, sort of, the, how much code switching is performed in my daily life as a professional, as, 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 as an artist, as a, as a scholar. Um, could you, could you, David? I'm sorry. Could you just for just in case anybody hasn't heard that term before? Oh, code switching. Kind of, is, yeah, code switching. Yeah, what do you mean? The idea that when maybe I am in this community, I will speak a certain way and 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 have a certain sort of a, a, um, choice of words, or it's not just choice of words, but maybe even di dialectically what I would do. Um, and then when I'm in front of a different audience. Uh, um, I'll do that now. Of course, you know, um, in, in my in my field of performance studies, we say performance in everyday life. That's something everybody does. Uh, uh, you know, we are we we perform different personas to different audiences. But it's just struck me that this uh, for a, for a people who historically and and sort of uh, almost worldwide. Ha, tend to be defined by other people, which is something we've been talking about for uh, um, about how we are constantly defined by others. It seems to me that code switching has not is is not has has be has become. I don't know if it has become or is, and that's one of the things I'm curious to know. But it seems to be something that I find defines us in many ways, um, and and and. I am, I'm not yet there, but I'm almost thinking about it as an aesthetic, as a particular art that our, our circumstances and our histories uh, have endowed us with. Um, sometimes not in the most comfortable way, but then it, you know, um, so that, that's what, 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 what I, was, I was just thinking as we were, we were talking about this, yeah. I think that, it's, that is absolutely the case. Um, when it comes to, and, and that's actually what I was alluding to earlier, moving between worlds and being able to. And I think that that actually is a part of 
being black in America. Um, you, 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 I mean, it's, it's, you, you have to be able to move between worlds. I mean, uh, I just think about where I work and where, you know, being in Springfield, Missouri, where it's about 93, I think, 94% white, a uh, very small percentage of the population is black. And so being able to navigate that world, um, it, it's, it's, it's critical for mental survival uh, and in some instances, physical survival. Uh, you know, you, you have to be able to navigate that world. And um, I, I think that that is actually advantageous for many Black people. Um, I, I think that for some, it is soul crushing though. Um, and if we're talking about why Black Lives Matter, I think that that is something that has to not just be recognized, but I think that's something that needs to, I mean, that, that, that there needs to be, I don't know about studies, but there, I mean, you know, what does it mean to have to be able to, and, and, and I say have to, and I use that word on purpose, you have to be able to, to move between worlds um, because if you don't, then, you know, sorry to be honest, I mean, your life is going to be hell. Um, you know, if you, if you cannot navigate moving between worlds, um, you know, existing in a white world, working in a world where you are um, the diversity individual, uh, or, or, you know, that, you know, that, 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 that again can be soul crushing uh, for, for some people. And a trip, a trip to the grocery store and back. Mm -hmm. can be a trip through many worlds. Yes. <laughs> yeah. You know, and this makes me think of, um, I, I, I read, over the summer, I read a book by Torre, who is an artist and a scholar. It's called Who's Afraid of Post-Blackness? And he talks about post-blackness, which is sort of this postmodern condition of being Black and sort of, you know, um, being sort of outside of whatever that little box is that, that American culture has tried to put Blackness in. Um, and he talked toward the end of his book about President Obama. And he says, Obama um, could not have, you know, um, he doesn't, <laughs> I, I'm be careful how I say this, because I don't want to misrepresent him or like say the wrong thing. But let me just first start off by saying that I miss Obama and I wish he was back in office. But, um, but, uh, but he says, Obama, um, a black, he was the first black president and <clears throat> a black person could not become president Torre says, and I'm, I'm, I may be putting words in his mouth a little bit, but he says, a black person could not become president unless he um, is able to make both black and white people feel like he cares about them and they can trust him. And this is why Obama can become president, but Farrakhan cannot in, a, in the United States of America. <clears throat> and so there is this kind of uh, position that we find ourselves in, I think, as people who are you know, um, public figures in our community, people who are like, you know, um, uh, professors in our, in our academic programs, people who are leaders, who are on committees, who are board members or president of the faculty senate or whatever that is, where we feel like, you know, like we have to, um, we have to be very, very good at code switching, you know, and, and code switching is not lying. It's not being disingenuous. It's not manipulation. It's, you know, Obama, I believe Obama truly does love both white and black people. I believe that he's not just pretending to love white people to get votes, you know, um, but uh, uh, he also grew up, you know, biracial and he grew up, uh, uh, he went to school with uh, white kids. I mean, he, he sort of like, like uh, sort of like you, Marlon and Jen and, and me, um, he grew up really knowing, intimately knowing white people. You know, and so there is this interesting, um, there is a, an interesting dilemma that most black people I think find themselves in or an interesting situation that all black people find themselves in. Jen, you wanna say something, please go. <laughs> the, the, the thing is, and that I can appreciate that, that concept of code shifting, phase shifting, being able to do what we need to do in whatever circumstance we're in. And it is a survival thing. I, I respect that so much. But on the other end of that, I, 
still think that we get to make a choice about the uh, image that we project or portray because the other side of that is true as well. I know that a lot of us have gone into space and maybe we speak pretty good and we have some education. So then what do they, what do you hear? Oh, well, you're the, you're the whitest black guy I've ever heard. Mm-hmm. And that to me means that I failed. That means to me, if I have basically decided that um, some sort of white public face is more important than being true to myself, that's, that, that's, that's disgraceful. And so for me, it's important to go that, yeah, there have been times when I've had to do what I need to do and say what I need to say to get in and out of a space, mm-hmm. but I don't have to go on autopilot. I, I think we get to, to live with that intention. And I think that that's what's, to me, the older I get more important to make sure that I'm constantly reevaluating the public face I'm presenting. How, how do I feel? What do I really feel? And, and not making it about making people feel they can trust me. How do I feel? <laughs> do I feel I can trust these people? If, if, if I uh, let everyone know that I'm not a threat, have I undermined my own ability to be in that space? So it's, it's kind of making sense of that, that as well. And, and, and I think that, that um, you know, this is, this is the point where I would love to bring in kind of a conversation about the white gaze, right? Um, Torre also mentions, uh, he, he has a whole section of a chapter on the word nigga, right? Um, and he says, he, he starts it by saying, if, uh, if, 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 if blackness was a celeb, was, was, if blackness was a person, nigga would be a celebrity, right? <laughs> you know, who throws his, you know, power and weight around, right? And he talks about Richard Pryor kind of bringing it into the public, you know, I very pointedly to take away its power and also to reclaim the, his own power with it. There's a whole conversation to be had about like the reason why people use that word is political. And I, I feel like I need to say this really quickly, but I, I feel like we need to, there's, there's something I wanna ask you all to respond to, but I wanna say real quick, because I feel like there are people listening who, who need to hear it, is that the use of that word, I don't necessarily use it, I don't necessarily condone it, but I think it's a political act of um, reappropriation of a word that has been historically used to uh, destroy us. And it is a political act, a militant act really of, um, of, of stepping up and, and sp- kind of spitting in, in, in the face of the white gaze that would oppress us, like this, this whiteness that says you should be more like me. And, um, and, and, and it, it's not, and call it what you want. I don't, I don't, it's not my style, you know, but, uh, but I respect it. Um, but what I really want to talk about, what I really want to kind of end before we open it up to questions, I just want to ask you all to respond to this really quickly. And feel free to just say, no, I want to talk about that, what you just said. I have something to say. But um, because of the title of this is what is sort of like, why does Black life matter? What is Blackness in terms of Black aesthetics? Like if we talk about aesthetics, those all those things that are like our assessment of what is what is beautiful and what is art and what is uh, what is the form of it and what is the meaning of it and all of these kinds of things. Um, what would you say just briefly defines what blackness really is for you? And then, uh, then I think we need to open up to uh, a Q and A with our with our audience. So, um, whoever wants to start. I mean, I I could chime in real quick. Um, so, it, it's really difficult. To, to define it, that goes without saying, you know, it, it's something that um, for me personally just boils down to a personal learned experience. It, you know, it's not something that, um, it's something that like I have to wake up and define every day, you know? And um, I think all of us, I mean, I, I, I know what it's like to go into a space and somebody sees you especially as a, as a musician or an artist, and they make assumptions about what you like and what you should like. I mean, I, I, mean, I, I think that we've talked about this, uh, 
where, you know, I listen to a lot of heavy music, a lot of rock and metal music. I've gone into space and I've heard people play Chili Peppers and playing Oasis and then look at me and go, oh, he's a musician, let's play some blues. And they feel like that is some sort of like, okay, I, huh, huh, black? That is not black to me. Black is not a projection from white people. It can never be a projection from white people. Blackness, it, it, you know, it, it, it's, it's actually something what uh, Dr. David had said earlier, like we're black no matter what. You know, so it's a matter of how do I define it? It cannot be someone telling me you're black because you do this or you don't do this. To me, it's I am the real deal and I accept that. You you said when we talked the other night that you refused to play the blues for a long time with other people because of these experiences. And I've heard you play the blues and you can play the blues, you know, and, and I mean, you, 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 you know, that is that is your your heritage and uh you refuse to do it for that reason and i i get it you see even even that to me like it, I'm, it's funny you say that i think mm -hmm. a lot of times when we come to black people we start using words synonymously mm. right? and so a lot of times people will say well blues is our culture but what they mean is black is the culture. Everyone will say, well, all popular music came from the blues. It did not. All popular music came from black people. Mm -hmm. And for me, as a person that, you know, again, I grew up really in a very white space, but you know, obviously I have uncles, my grandfather, and they're all preachers and ministers. And these black men could not play blues in church. You, you know, the black church looked at the blues as the devil's music. So we're again talking about a cultural concept. You're talking about going into space where people are making assumptions about you that are not rooted in reality. So to me, it goes back again to, we, we do need to honor a certain cultural heritage, but it has to be self-defined. We have to constantly be pulling back these layers because otherwise blackness is not narrated by black people and that's unacceptable mm. to me mm. Mm. thank you yeah I, I don't i don't think that you 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 can necessarily define it um it's kind of like you know asking somebody well what's american culture you can't it's an amalgamation of things you you can't just pick one or five different things because it's going to be and it has to be determined by the individuals um just you know to, to echo what, what you were saying and you know it 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 you, you know, there is not one single definition. I don't think that there ever will be. And I think that it is always evolving and it, 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 it's up to individuals and how they define it for themselves. Um, you know, so, you know, you know, what is it? You know, it's, it's a variety of things and it is up to individuals. And, and one more thing, I think that in part, when we talk about well, why do Black lives matter, um, Black people, for the most part, have been left out of the grand narrative. If, if we're talking about uh, the narrative of the United States, Black people have generally been left out or have been pigeonholed, uh, stuck within certain parameters. And that has, you're absolutely right, Jen, that has generally been defined by someone else, putting people in, putting black people in, and here's where we need you to be. We don't want you to be, you know, we, we don't want you over here. We don't want you over there. We need you to be right here. And therefore it is easier for us to deal with you in this space right here. Well, when black people start moving out of that and saying, no, I'm not gonna be defined by that. Um, then many times it disrupts that narrative. It, dis it disrupts that story, you know, so, um, and John, I was actually, and I'm going to hop off here, uh, or at least let David speak, but I saw that you had put something in about the 1619 project. Um, the biggest pushback, at least from the academic standpoint on that, is who is telling that story. It's not necessarily about what's in it. It's not about holding America's feet to the fire. It's the, the pushback, at least from academia, comes down to, well, who's telling that story? It's a non it's non-academic. And it's a black woman who is telling that story, who is putting that out there. And that's where most of the criticism comes from, at least yeah. from academia. Mm. I, 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 real, let me just ask you a quick follow-up question to that. 
as an as a as a history professor as an academe um what do you think about the kind of pushback that uh, uh, that Nicole Hanna is getting, you know, from 1619? Um, I, I don't have a problem with a journalist, you know, venturing into history. Um, I, I, I see value in individuals that do legitimate research and no amount of research or no research is perfect. So to sit and say, well, you know, this isn't how we would do it or this isn't how it should be done. All right, fine, but nothing is perfect. You know, no, no book, no book that a historian, I don't care how published you are, it's not perfect. There are flaws in it. Um, so I see value in journalists uh, presenting history. I see value in, um, in, uh, in, in, in English professors. Or, or you know, someone with an English background, or from a psychology background, it all adds value. It's all a part of the big story, and so there's value that can be found in it. Um, you know, but but you know, getting upset about who is telling the story because you know they're venturing into your domain. Um, I don't know. Uh, that just seems kind of petty to me. But you know. and no one got upset when you know textbook authors in Texas, you know, called slaves you know, domestic workers. Right. <laughs> uh, well, well but, academics did. They, 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 they pushed back okay, on that. All one. right. Okay. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, you know, I, I, I look at, I look at the 1619 project the way, same way I look at like This American Life or any of the PRX, you know, it's journalistic storytelling, you know, and um, it's history, but it's not, you know, I mean, you know, it, you, you want to fact check it, but I mean, she's getting at an essence of something, you know, and sometimes it's, I don't know, that's a whole other topic. <laughs> um, Dr. Dacor, uh, final thoughts, what is blackness uh, to you? Oh, you're, you're muted, Dr. Dacor. I think that Blackness to me is an honest self-expression by a black person, basically, right? Um, and I, I, basically, I'm, I'm saying what others have said uh, about the, the impossibility of definition in a different way, right? Um, to sort of highlight how practically I engage it. If someone who is black is, is expressing something that is their lived experience, for me, that, that, that inflects my understanding of blackness, our general sense of blackness. And if it's an honest expression coming from them, coming from their lived experience, whatever that they lived experience, and they are black, then for me, that is blackness because that is adding to the tapestry, that is adding to the to the mix of 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 of, of the that's adding to the different shades of, of, of what blackness is. And sometimes mm -hmm. that can also mean that someone is when that can also mean that someone I, i'm using the word honest dishonesty but 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 I'm, I'm using dishonesty in a in a careful way not to say that they're, they're being dishonest but what i'm trying to say is sometimes someone may be be presenting themselves in a way that is different from who they, who they are right but they might they might be doing it in a way that to make a case about who they are I don't know if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And so that itself for me becomes an honest expression, even though it is not a, 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 a it's not very similitude, it's not exactly who they are. I, mm -hmm. I, I don't know if I'm I'm making sense. So any 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 for me, any self-expression that is that is by somebody uh, who is black uh, and, and reflects their lived experience is black to me. Okay. All right. Thank you, David. Uh, I want to go to some questions. Um, uh, Katie, if we go over 730, is that okay? Yeah, um, that's fine. Okay. Um, we won't get kicked out. <laughs> okay, good, we, we, good, you good. know, if whoever wants to hang out, I just wanted to remind everybody the, the Q&A um, option is down in the middle of your screen. And gentlemen, we had a great question come in mm -hmm. um, just a few minutes ago, and I think you all can see it. And I'm interested in your responses on this one as mm -hmm. well. Uh, and then, and then I have a question as well. So, uh, but, but please, um, if you're watching, you know, ask, ask a question to our presenters. I think this conversation is fascinating. 
Thank you. Um, Katie, I actually just typed in a response to that question. I thought it was absolutely fascinating and, and, mm -hmm. and pertinent as well. Um, and as I was you know, doing a little research and kind of preparing for this, um, you know, you know, because the, the question is about black women and, you know, there are no black women represented on this panel. Um, absolutely. Uh, and how, you know, share the responsibility as black men to amplify the voices of black women. And in preparing for this, you know, uh, the, you know, the black aesthetic and looking at, at this, you know, I was examples, uh, again, historically, because that's my wheelhouse, but Phyllis Wheatley and her poetry and contributing, you know, uh, to the black aesthetic. Um, I, I, I have examples of, of Harriet Powers, who she, she uh, produced quilts. She had, was, was enslaved. And then by the end of the 19th century, she was producing quilts that told the story of, of, of cultural transfusion and, 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 and of her family and her religion. Um, and, and again, you know, the book by Katrina Thompson that I showed earlier, you know, um, you know, all black women, black women were so important in carrying and communicating and sharing this aesthetic with the world. Um, you know, it, it cannot be stated enough that, uh, that they were the ones who were taking care of black homes um, while individuals were enslaved. Um, and in taking care of, you know, the homes many times of the individuals that were enslaving them. And so, I mean, there, it, it can't be said enough. Um, and, but again, I'm looking at it from, from a historical standpoint, um, you know, being in, in my, in, in my area of expertise. I would, I would just to piggyback on that, I would say that um, one of the one of the, the greatest, I think, injustices, social injustices that is happening to black people today is that um, black women are, you know, at the, at, you know, are, are probably of all the demographics, the most oppressed, you know, and yet they are the, um, the most, among the most important people in our in our world, you know, and so um, so uh, the fact that you know, I mean, I I know that uh, uh, <laughs> it just kind of happens that the panelists are all you know male, um, and uh, that is the case. But uh, I think it's an important question, and just in case everybody doesn't have the question. It's could the panelists share what they feel their responsibility is as black men to amplify the voices of black women and support uplift and protect and fight for all black women in general. And I think that uh, I think it's everybody's responsibility um, to to demand that black women um, are, uh, receive their proper place at the table, you know, um, absolutely. You know, um, I, I totally agree. Um, the, 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 as far as this, our, our talk tonight, I can, I can only say that, you know, the panelists are all, are, are all black men. Um, my inspiration behind all of this was a black woman uh, who I, I um, uh, and, and her talk is in the link and I do highly, um, highly uh, suggest that everybody take a look at that. Um, it's really, really important lecture, so. Mm -hmm. So this is Katie from the library. <laughs> so uh, my question for you all, because I am the librarian, as someone who is deep diving now into so many of these issues and trying to learn so much, and we hear a lot of books about, uh, you know, white fragility, and so you want to talk about race, but specific to this topic, this conversation, the contributions of Black individuals to our, our arts, our culture, our literature, do you all have books or wh whatever, you know, I know you've mentioned some in the links, but specifically some books that you might suggest um, to someone like me who's just trying to get a real um, thorough overview of, of the history of some of these things, any particular good titles? I mean, you guys had to know this is coming. This is the library, right? <laughs> <laughs> 
I mean, I, I've, I've got, you know, some things, I mean, for me, um, and funny enough, it, it goes back to, um, I used to be part of the Wob Bob's musical book club, which was associated with the library. And, yes. Um, <laughs> you know, and that, I just still have just such great memories of that. But I mentioned that to say that like during roughly a year, I did almost every month and uh, not just read books. I, I sometimes cheated. I, I sometimes watched movies. To me, it was, I never looked at it as cheating. I was just like, let me get the story in my brain so that I can try to write songs for it. And so that's kind of how I look at all of this. A lot of times I think um, a lot of white people have absolutely, like, like we've talked about code shifting and being able to walk in so-called white spaces and black spaces and being credible in both. What most of the white folk that maybe grew up in Springfield have not necessarily had to have learned to walk in several spaces. Um, so to me, starting from scratch, st you know, reading books by MLK, I know the autobiography of Malcolm X has saved my life, literally, you know, um, reading also again, movies, everything Spike Lee has done, you know, mm -hmm. uh, there was the, um, a brilliant movie he did called Bamboozled. Mm -hmm. It was actually recently uh, put the Blu-ray and kind of got a re-release. It was out of print for a long time. Starting from scratch, just getting any sort of information from a Black cultural, sp cultural perspective. It doesn't mean that that represents all Black people or anything like that, but just starting with the idea of saying, can I be informed by Black humanity? So movies i think you know and i know that the library rents movies so we do yeah starting with like just the simplest things spike lee john singleton um getting these perspectives in one's mind that's important mm -hmm. john singleton just passed away last year um but uh it, for those of you who don't know the name he did boys in the hood was his first he was 23 years old right out of usc and then he did uh poetic justice with janet jackson and tupac shakur um, uh, Rosewood was another one of his. Um, but uh, I, I, I would reflect that, Jen, and say there are a lot of films. Uh, I've been listening to a lot of podcasts lately, Katie. And um, there's one that I'm listening to right now that is called Louder Than a Riot. And it looks, it starts with this question of the relationship between gangster rap music and the prison industrial complex in the 80s and the rise of mass incarceration. And it kind of goes from there. Uh, really, really important podcast, I think. I'm only a couple episodes in, but that leads me to think about, um, obviously, uh, the, the documentary, The 13th, is something that everybody should watch. Michelle Alexander's book, uh, the, the, the New Jim Crow, is something everyone should read. Um, but even going further, further back, I, you know, I'm sad to say this, but I only read Roots for the first time like a couple years ago. And uh, I had kind of seen the, the show when as a kid and whatnot, you know, but uh, that is just an amazing, actually, I didn't read it. I listened to the audio book. And I only say that because um, Avery Brooks is the narrator and his voice is perfect. He, he really does a great job of sort of evolving the accent of Kunta Kente throughout. It's really quite fascinating. I would highly recommend the audio book and you can listen to it in your car. And it might take you a few months because it's a long book. But um, Roots uh, is, is terrific. Um, uh, everyone should read that. Everyone should read The New Jim Crow um, by Michelle Alexander. Everyone should watch The 13th. And, and um, the other thing, uh, the, the 1619 podcast is another one that I feel like that's only like five or six episodes and you can get through it in an afternoon if you're just doing nothing else, you know, and um, I recommend that. Um, mostly what I have to offer, Katie, is is a lot of podcasts right now because that's great. I'm doing, I'm doing so many things that I, I don't have time to sit down and read anything. Like I oh, listen yeah. to a lot of audiobooks. Oh, and also uh, I mentioned it and I think I put, I might have put the title in the chat, but Toure, which is spelled like the word tour, like T O U R with an E and an apostrophe over the E. Uh, he wrote a book called Who's Afraid of Post Blackness that I thought was really, really illuminating personally. So, uh, um, those are things that I would recommend. Great. Mm -hmm. I, I have been 
this this is my current interest. So that's what I'm, I'm I've been looking at black travel writing, and that is partly, particularly because it's always fascinating for me to see black people encountering different kinds of blackness, right? So I I I am very interested in um, and I've been going back to read uh, um, um, there is a Pell Primus who was a dancer um, in the um, 1940s and took uh, about a 13 country tri trip to, to Africa. Um, Richard Wright, who went there, uh, Thompson Arabelle, who was the editor of um, Ebony. They all have these uh, books that uh, they are, they are, they are accounts of their experiences um, uh, as, as, as they, were, they, were, they were going to other black spaces. And so um, I would say something by Pel, Pel Primus about their travels to uh, Africa, um, 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 Thompson era Bell or, or Richard Wright's trip. And you would see them reacting uh, in very different ways based on their own class and backgrounds. <laughs> But it's, it's, it's fascinating to see, to see those multiple shades. Yeah. That's really interesting. I'm gonna, I, 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 I'm gonna have to talk to you, David, about some of those sources. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Marlon, did you have anything you wanted to add? Who, me? Yeah. All right. No, it's okay. Oh. Um, I mean, we, we've we, got a yeah, great yeah, list. Yeah. I mean, as far as, you know, literature and things, I mean, I was thinking, um, I was definitely thinking Richard Wright, that, that definitely has had, had a big, big influence on, on me. Uh, when I was, when I was doing my PhD, my outside area of influence was black literature. And I know that native son, you know, and just kind of that work and, and Ellison, Ralph Ellison um, was 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 very pivotal in just kind of my interest in in that area. So that would be something that I would recommend. Of course, um, you know, uh, well, um, <laughs> I'm trying to think outside of academia uh, because uh, I mean that's I, I do have a have a lot of 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 that. Um, that's okay. <laughs> didn't mean yeah. to put you on the spot. I yeah. just wanted to be sure if you had anything you could, you could, if you wanted to, you could add. So, yeah. Um, um, I think, I think if something comes to mind, I will definitely send that your way. Yeah, please do. I'm going to develop a, a list out of this. So, okay. yeah. Could I also just add, by the way, anything by James Baldwin? I find that James yeah. Baldwin, like when he, the stuff that he was writing about 60 years ago, <laughs> is so oddly relevant today, you know, and uh, Gail, Gail, my wife Gail uh, found an article recently from, was it Ebony or Essence magazine from back in the 80s, I think it was, and it was just a dialogue between, uh, between James Baldwin and Audre Lorde about, um, about sort of Black masculinity and femininity and relationships and i can't I, I can't remember if it was titled i don't know if it was published anywhere else i need to I, i'll try and find it before we're done here and send it to you katie so that maybe you can kind of post a link but i i have i wasn't thinking about it until just a second ago when you mentioned ralph ellison um marlon i started thinking about writers you know from the the the, the first half of the 20th century and i went oh yeah you know <laughs> so anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, Essence 1984, I'll, I'll, I'll try and find the link. Uh, we did have another question come through in the um, chat uh, from Sophia. And um, I don't know how you'd all like to respond to that. It's a pretty complex question, but maybe you have an answer for her. I'll give you a moment. Uh, I'll just, I'll, I'll read it aloud if that's okay. Um, after the past few months of seeing how greatly impacted my friends and teammates have been by racism happening in a world today, how can me as a white woman slowly understanding the reality of people of color step in and make a stride toward racial reconciliation where I'm at? 
I believe it starts with educating, listening, and, emp and, and empathizing because I can't possibly understand what Black people have gone through and go through today. But how would you suggest a way I can tangibly advocate for my Black friends? Well, I think, I mean, initially, the, the, you've already taken the first step um, in, in just kind of putting yourself out there and, and asking and uh, being willing uh, or at least open to be an advocate. Um, I mean, I think that that is where it starts. Um, I think that it also, I mean, it's, it requires legwork. I mean, I think part of where, you know, America and, and people kind of get into, you know, they get fatigued. You know, it's like, hey, you know what, we, we had the 60s, we had the civil rights movement, we, we had the 70s, we got a bunch of laws passed. Of course, if you change laws, that's going to change things. And that's, we know that that's not true. Um, and what Black people have been saying for, well, forever in, in America is that these things are going on. However, those that that cry that you know those messages have largely been unheard or just ignored uh well now i think people are seeing it even more so uh and it and how frequently it happens um and so i think that for many people that are not black or that are not people of color i mean you know you you have to do the legwork and that includes you know some of the things that you've said, just listening, not trying to dominate a conversation or to project your thoughts or, you know, kind of how you view the situation, but just listen, listen to what people are saying, listen to, um, you know, and, and, and watch how they are acting. It's not always what people are saying, it's how they how they act how how you know how, how they are in a setting how they are with you um because many times you know you might think hey you know what everything is cool i mean they said it was cool but there you might still feel a level of tension well that quite honestly could be that people may not be ready to open up you know black people may not be ready to to invite you into that world um and so you know you you, you but you always need to be there if you want to be a real advocate Yeah, I, I, I co-sign on that. And I actually, that was kind of really what essentially exactly what I was thinking, maybe to, to speak to that. I think that um, sometimes I think people kind of want to have their cake and they want to eat it too. They want to be able to say, I'm here for my, my black friends, but when they're hearing information that maybe causes some kind of cognitive dissonance, they want to lash out at these very black friends and they want these black folks to keep kind of signing up for that. And so one of the, I think the biggest challenges, it, it would be like in any, in any dynamic, if you had just two people of the same race, any race, gender, no matter what, if you want to advocate for that person, you kind of have to be willing to, um, like Dr. Mullen was saying, you know, listen, just to be informed by it doesn't mean that you have to agree or disagree, but just be willing to be informed by that perspective. And I think that, you know, we're again talking about kind of something that we've, we've, you know, gone over so much of the, the stories that people read, the movies, the television are not from a black perspective. And I think that, um, I always make kind of a, uh, a partial joke essentially that a lot of times, you know, many people grew up watching sitcoms where black people were the butt of the jokes. And I think that a lot of times when people meet with actual black people, they a lot of times want to bring that energy. And it's not it's not intellectually honest. So I guess my point is, is that I believe that most black people um, are very open to speak about our experiences especially if we feel that we can trust the person that we feel that we're going to be heard um, and we and you know just being able to go okay i hear what you're saying that that's important so that's what that's how i would respond to that i would my my take on that would be 
it, it would be good to, to, patience would be a great virtue if, if you want to uh, 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 do this. Um, just because I, I recall as, as a lot of these shootings and, and police brutalities were occurring, I would have my white friends ask me how, what they can do to be supportive. And there were times I would say, I don't know. And it was, un, it was honest. I just did not know because I was still processing it. And so oh, you teach, you teach about race. You, and I said, well, opening books, opening lives is not the same as opening books. And, uh, and, and so I, I, living it is different than reading it. And so I may not have all the answers. So basically my point is you may, when you get an, I don't know, it does not mean I don't care that you care. <laughs> It just means I'm not at that place yet. I think uh, I'll just kind of add to this, just because I think this is something that's um, uh, <laughs> immediately current for me, actually, is um, I very, very recently found myself in a position where I had kind of stepped in it a little bit. And I um, un unknowingly, un unintentionally um, offended and hurt somebody who is important to me. And they called me on it, you know? Um, and I think that, you know, you have to be okay with and ready to be called on your mistakes. And you have to be ready to say, you're right, I hear you, I'm sorry. I take full responsibility. Thank you for holding me accountable. Um, and, um, and, and, and this happened to me very, very recently. So, um, that's that's where my mind is right now in response to your question. Um, I, I think just we have to be all of us, everyone. Uh, we have to recognize that we are dealing with a situation that you can't you can't grow up in America without having all kinds of programming that contributes to a system of racism and white supremacy. Um, and it doesn't matter what color you are or what your race is or what your ethnicity is. We're all sort of programmed because that's what, you know, is in the fabric of America. You know, it, it started with colonialism and, and stealing lands and stealing people to, to create wealth. And, and, um, and, and we're not that, you know, it, it wasn't that long ago. So we can't help it, you know, uh, uh, but we can be aware of it and we can say the buck stops here and take responsibility and say that, you know, so it's important, I think, um, in answer to that question to be ready to be courageous on both ends of it, you know, be courageous when you hear so or see something that isn't right and speak truth to that and be courageous whenever somebody speaks truth to you when you were not right and, and be courageous and, and, uh, and patient and, and willing and humble enough to say, I'm sorry, I'm gonna do better next time. I think that's really, really important, so, yeah. I think that's a really good place to leave off tonight if you are all in agreement. Um, I think we've had an amazing conversation, um, but we're closing in on almost an hour and a half here, so I wanna <laughs> be sure to, <laughs> to, to wrap up. Um, I dropped my email in the chat. If anyone would like just a page of all the resources in one place that everybody's talked about tonight, I will compile that. If you just shoot me an email to kdh at the library.org, uh, I will get that sent to you in the next few days. Um, I want to thank all of our presenters. This is where we would do a big round of applause if we were all together in person. Um, if this was interesting to you tonight, oh, uh, oh, someone raised their hand I didn't know maybe that was their applause so um if this <laughs> if this type of programming was interesting to you if you're watching tonight I would encourage you um like I said at the top of our program to go to the library.org slash programs um we're kicking off a series called we need to talk and that's next Tuesday at 6 30 and it's very uh similar casual format to this it's a conversation about white privilege and what that is and what that looks like to us. And so I would welcome you all to come to that. We're also doing a series um, for our Oh the Horror about sort of flipping HP Lovecraft on his head. You know, he was very overtly racist. And so we're welcoming um, 
The last week we had Victor Laval. Next week we'll have Matt Ruff, who wrote Lovecraft Country. And then we're also having um, P. Jelly Clark, who wrote a book called Ring Shout, uh, which is a horror novel. So I would, I would just encourage everybody to check out those programs. Thank you, gentlemen, all for coming so much. This was so good. And um, I hope everybody has a wonderful evening. John, did you have anything else you wanted to say? Uh, just thank you, Katie. And thank you, my brothers, for being here. And uh, thank you, everybody who showed up to listen. Thank you, John. Thank you, everyone. Have a great evening. We'll see you later. Okay. Have a good night.